All right, welcome aboard again for another ICS Defense Force. My name is Dean Parsons, Certified SANS Instructor for ICS 515 and ICS 418. So thanks again for coming today. Today's question and ICS Defense Force will talk about patching the industrial control systems. What do you mean patch the ICS? So when is the appropriate time to patch the ICS? Where can you patch? What do you prioritize in patching? And how do you go about doing this? So let's jump right in. As always with any ICS Defense Force episode, it covers everything from cookie factories to critical infrastructure. So if you're in <clears throat> one of these areas, we're going to cover and have something specific and applicable to your sector. As always as well, any comments, questions throughout, please drop those in the comments section and we'll try to pivot through some of those questions as we kind of go through and progress. So the question is really around when or why do you actually patch? Now, of course, patching in general has many, many different benefits in IT and ICS. We're going to cover why we patch in ICS. We'll cover what you're going to patch. Of course, we have Windows OT assets. We have engineering devices, PLCs, controllers. We have meters, and so on and so forth, engineering assets. So what do we patch in the patching process? And also, when is the appropriate time to patch? Now, if we take a look at why we patch, it's not that different from IT, but the approach on how we do that is going to be very interesting. If we take a look at why we patch, compliance can drive us down this road, which is great. In doing that, we can actually reduce our attack surface as well and our, our, our risks generally by patching vulnerable systems, etc. But beyond that, we're all security folks here, right? Some engineering folks as well, I hope. But beyond the security ramifications and benefits, we do see engineering aspects as well. So patching for the purpose of engineering and process stability. Patching to make sure we have possible new features available to our engineering staff as well is another reason to patch. Now, specifically to a new engineering feature, the one I love to see is industrial control systems patching the lower level devices, the engineering devices to gain something like a syslog capability. With that capability to get more information from the device itself, we can leverage syslog capabilities and controller upgrades to make sure we can get more real-time security event data from them. So love the idea of updating firmware in the field to get more security logging capabilities from the field devices. So there's lots of reasons why to patch in the industrial control environment. Uh, excellent. Some folks from Singapore, welcome aboard. Super good stuff, guys. All right. Some folks from Houston as well. All right. So what about how often do we patch in industrial control systems versus in the IT space? So let's do a quick pop quiz here. Pop quiz is how often do you see IT systems and IT environments being patched versus the ICS or OT space being patched? We'll come up with the pop quiz answers in a moment, but let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining from France. Very, very cool. So generally patching in IT systems is super, super solid. They've been doing patching in IT for decades and it's like a weld oiled machine runs like clockwork and that's super awesome. What I do want to suggest as well, though, in the ICS, there may be times where we simply cannot patch the industrial control systems, possibly at any level of the environment, if it's a Windows OT device or engineering device. And an example of that is in the wintertime in the colder regions of the globe where there's actually like really cold temperatures and snow. In some of those in, uh, environments during the winter months, there's situations where in electric, for example, they choose either to reduce the patching inside the ICS to uh, uh, you know, uh, not have as much risk in the environment. But in, uh, also we do see uh, electric sectors maybe possibly not patching during the winter months. And it comes back to the risk to operations, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, we also see as well vendors helping out patching in the ICS. And what I mean by that is they actually do get the OT patch system, patching devices or, or patches in general, and they vet those patches against their software. Will the new patches coming out work with their software? So we see these vendors verify their software on common operating systems after patch notifications have come out. 
then we're um, going to be using their portals as an example and their security uh, advisories to understand if the patches that are released do uh, you know are applicable and capable with the software and the engineering systems and then we can potentially use that to verify and push patches out so i'll come back to that question about patch frequency again how often do you see it being patched versus the ics or ot environments being patched as well so we're going to jump into a common scenario, what we typically see today and possibly what we can do moving forward to further the idea of patching in the ICS. I want to say as well, the idea of just patching vulnerabilities in the ICS is probably not the smartest way to go about it. You want to prioritize the patching, which we'll get to in a second. But let's look at a common scenario first. Now, of course, on the right side, we do have the familiar Purdue model and the levels from zero to four. In this case, and level zero, we have the sensor actuators. We also have a level one, we have the PLCs, RTUs, the instrument systems, embedded HMIs, for example, local HMIs. And of course, in level two, we have the general HMI, which could be a Windows OT asset. We have engineering workstations and so on and so forth. So in this common scenario, we do see an OT specific patch server. This can exist at level three or level 3.5, generally in an ICS DMZ. Now this OT patch specific server can serve up patches for the ICS or OT environment. Specifically, it can be a Windows WSUS server, again, an OT service, uh, you know, filtering down those up to Windows OT assets inside the ICS, likely servicing the DMZ level three and possibly level two as well for those Windows OT assets. But moreover, the OT, patch server or servers could also be a Linux system as well. So if you're running Linux traditional operating system, which is still an OT asset inside the ICS environment, can be running things like a Red Hat Linux uh, satellite solution, which is patching for Red Hat Linux devices. So generally we see in this common scenario, the placement of a patch server specifically to the OT environment. In these areas here, level two, level three, and level four potentially are way more patched or more frequently patched than lower levels of the Purdue. Specifically, if, as an example, if you have the operator's human machine interface, a Windows OT device, possibly that can be patched because the operator can lit literally use the local HMIs we see in level one to still operate, control, and monitor the process. When that uh, Windows OT HMI is being patched, operations can still continue as expected and then go back to that other HMI in level two for the time being. So again, we see more frequent patching in these specific levels. As we get lower in the Purdue model, <clears throat> we see less frequent patching being conducted. So specifically with controllers, with RTUs, safety instrumented systems, and so on and so forth. So generally we see more testing required <clears throat> in the lower levels of the Purdue. Moreover, you might not be using or might not have the capability to have a server like we have up in level three to manage some of these devices. So in the less frequent patching zones at the lower level, we see more on-site visits engineering staff going to update programmable logic controllers and so on, being on site with firmware in hand to upload directly to the device on site. <clears throat> Excuse me. So generally we have this as the again, more frequent area and more and less frequent area as we go through. Um, all right, lots of folks and more folks from Houston is such an awesome place in, in this time of year. Uh, probably don't have to worry about utilities uh, not patching in the wintertime there. Now, do you have some guidance available for us in the uh, community. This where specifically comes from CSA, and it's generally a flow chart to guide us through the industrial control space patching. I want to draw attention to a couple things here in this flow chart, pretty easy to read, and really we're going to focus on first the vulnerability footprint and also the impact, biz needs, and the operations. I want to point out both of those analysis piece goes into an analysis or risk evaluation. Below that risk evaluation is generally the main question we're here to answer is changing the industrial environment, patching the industrial environment, the operational needs greater than the risk. Now, I'm specifically drawing attention to one thing that we're all very, very familiar with, which is the common vulnerability scoring system. So CVSS. So with a CVSS rating of a potential vulnerability, it says, well, you know, here's a high risk or critical risk. And a lot of organizations jump on that and help to to use that CVSS information to guide their patching priority. And that's all fine and well and good. 
Back to this flow chart, though, we do see analysis risk area and evaluation where CVSS is only part of the uh, input to a risk evaluation for patching industrial control systems. So what am I saying, really? Let's get down to this. I'm saying that ultimately facilities need to ask this main question. Does the ICS engineering or operational needs outweigh the risk of a potentially identified vulnerability within the control system that actually being exploited and accessed can be successful? Is there an exploit available? Can that exploitation lead to an actual impact in the ICS? So generally, don't only use CVSS. So as you see here, evaluation of risk, going down to understanding if there's a risk uh, that can take down the system. If there's not, then we can actually schedule that patch and have that scheduled into a regular maintenance window. Now, of course, with the when do you patch ICS, largely we do see patching less frequent than in IT. And don't worry, the pop quiz answers are in the next slide. Generally, do we do see the ICS patching specifically at the lower levels of the Purdue being patched in alignment with the industrial control system or engineering staff maintenance cycles. So when there is a maintenance cycle for a generator, for example, to change out bearings in, in something or some uh, a physical component that needs to be changed out or maintained, that's when you would dovetail on your patching as well in that scheduled maintenance cycle, which may not be uh, you know every 30 days as an example, and so on and so forth. So you see how this flow chart works. Now, Getting to specifically the threat approach we'll talk about in a second, but first, the answer to the pop quiz. What do you guys have in the comments for this? Um, yeah, so the pop quiz answers are generally we see IT every 30 days patching like clockwork. In ICS, we see generally maybe twice a year. We see more so quarterly now as well, which is really, really good. So generally, we are getting better for uh, patching the industrial control systems. And yes, if you are NERC and NERC SIP compliant, it's even more rapid than that, which is really good as well. Seeing again the compliance drivers push patching in OT and ICS. <clears throat> Specifically in NERC SIP compliance, at least once every 35 calendar days, we have to evaluate security patches for applicability. We have to then release uh, since the last patch cycle or, or the last evaluation. And 35 days after that, you have to have completion of the evaluation and then take action, which could be one of three things. Specifically, applying the patch, creating a mitigation plan, or revising an exist existing mitigation plan as well. Yeah, so looking at some of the comments flowing, which is awesome. You guys are super on the ball here with the questions. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, having some packets chop. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, no worries. Um, looking at patching here, thanks, Rat. Uh, Rod indicated here that patching on level three and into the layer one can uh, only be done with control system manufacturers' recommendations uh, capable. Uh, absolutely. So I think what you're saying there, and I totally agree, is that you know patching the lower levels, manufacturers or vendors are going to be part of that solution, but also your engineering staff. So this is not going to be uh, just uh, just your your security team, uh, you know, patching the ICS. You're going to have involvement with a lot of engineering folks as well. Uh, all right, so it looks like we're all mostly in line with uh, generally when we are seeing patches uh, in IT versus in the ICS. So what about a threat-centric approach? How do you prioritize some of those vulnerabilities that you need to patch inside the industrial environment? Let's take a look at this. Now, we know that IT has a different risk surface than in ICS. And a really good example of that, we have far less users. We don't have an email system that takes a lot of malware in via spear phishing and whatnot. So it's a very different risk surface. So generally, a threat-centric approach to ICS or OT patching can be prioritized based on these areas. So one is placing importance on vulnerabilities that provide remote network access to the adversary and prioritizing those vulnerabilities that have publicly available exploits attached to them. Beyond that, of course, looking at the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of threats is critical here. This reminds us to not only look at the CVSS scores. And here's a great example. If we only see the adversary uh, living off the land, abusing the HMI, that's not an exploit. It's legitimate abuse of a legitimate service. So living off the land is harder to detect, but in general, there's no patching required there. It's general security controls and so on and so forth. So 
adversaries exploiting vulnerabilities versus living off the land. There could be situations where there is a vulnerability, it doesn't have an exploit, but you have weak systems and adversaries can get access to HMIs and other critical systems, which could have more damage and there's no exploit uh, even um, you know, a part of that attack. In addition, we talked about the CVSS scores, but knowing the architecture in the environment, properly implementing a network environment based on Purdue and enforcement boundaries or enforcement zones is also critical to reduce the adversary getting access to some of those vulnerabilities in the ICS. And of course, it goes without saying that having an asset inventory to understand the ICS risk surface uh, is, is definitely where you want to start. That's how you're going to understand where uh, your assets could be vulnerable in those Purdue zones, as an example. And we can't forget that vendors can help us with prioritizing this. And they do vet a lot of the patches that come out specifically with their, uh, their control system software and hardware as well. So now you may be asking as we get close to the end of this stream, what about the critical assets? Which ones of these critical assets do we patch first? So this is what we're going to talk about in the next ICS Defense Force. What are the most critical cyber assets in the industrial control environment that's applicable to most any ICS sector? And which ones of those do we patch or protect in general and do security around first? Before we end this section and go to a little bit of Q&A, uh, I want to remind everybody that we are looking for um, presentations for the upcoming SANS ICS Security Summit in 2022. This is coming in June, and it's going to be in June 2nd and 3rd in Orlando. So we're looking for you to submit a paper, a presentation. We're looking for attack demonstrations, uh, mitigations, you know, innovative mitigations, even regarding patching or something similar for threat defense and detection and analysis of recently discovered ICS tailored malware as well. So uh, if you want to uh, to submit, you have the time. We're closing the presentation call for uh, call for presentations on this coming Thursday. So we still have a few days left. So I want to point that out to everybody there. All right, so as we pivot, let's take a quick look if there's any questions in the comments area at this point. Now, we did talk about the IT, OT, uh, which is great, and the, the frequency. Uh, we do have one question here from Darren. Thanks very much again for joining, Darren. What are your thoughts on digital twins for testing patching? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Uh, really, do you have redundancy in place? So earlier when I mentioned patching at level three and HMI, which is could be a Windows device, a Windows OT device, operators tend to use those devices in control centers, control rooms, which is a comfortable area. But of course, when we do have an HMI at the local plant floor, the operator can choose to go there. So it's not going to be a test environment, but it is a way to reduce risk to the environment running the process from the local HMI. With regards specifically to having a digital twin or a test or a development environment, I love the idea. Of course, this is the best way to test out your environment. The issue comes around with regards to cost, however. I don't see a lot of organizations really having multiple HMIs that they can test and kind of swap in and swap out. Uh, but yes, you're right. That would be the best approach, 100%. Great question. Uh, all right, take a look here. Uh, all right. So all right, so with that, um, and, and great questions, everybody. With that, I do want to call a close to this ICS Defense Force. Again, looking forward to talking with you next week, and I uh, hope everybody is uh, uh, keeping their ICS secure. And we'll talk to you guys again then. Thanks.